I'm Scotty Moore, had three brothers, and my dad all played instruments. And it was 14 years difference between the, me and the next one up the line. And by the time I got around 10, 11, 12 years old, well, everybody was gone. My dad got old enough he didn't want to mess with it anymore, and that pretty much tells the story. And. I stayed out of school for one year, and my dad said it's okay. If you stay out of school, you got to got to help me on the farm, which I did. So he gave me a year, gave me a an acre of cotton, and I bought a big Gibson flat top guitar with that proceeds off of that one acre of cotton. And that was my that's when I started with Gibson. It's actually more than fifty years. But uh, so then, at uh, when I was fifteen, uh, after uh, uh, I joined the Navy and played a bunch of uh, Japanese uh, lookalikes guitars in the Navy, and the the frets were made out of beer cans. I'm sure because he played one thirty minutes and he was wore out. And so when I came out of the Navy. After being in there four years, I I bought a uh, uh, a Fender Esquire, and of course in the Navy I'd always always been sitting down playing. And when I started playing around around in Memphis, uh, was standing up and I couldn't hold it the Fender. So that and I was walking downtown main uh, downtown by the music store, OK Hauk, and they had just put a ES-295 in the window, and I saw it in that gold, I said, got to have it, don't care what kind, what it is, where it came from, I got to have it. And then I played that for uh, two or three years, I guess, through the early Elvis uh, years, and then, and then I bought a, uh, an L5, uh, blonde L5. See, back in the early days, any orchestra, they didn't tell you who was playing in the band. They also, the only, actually, the only people that uh, they knew anything about was like Chet Atkins and Merle Travis. And uh, later, a little bit later on, I heard I was listening to Les Paul, and uh, but. Uh, some of the other great players were on, they were studio players mainly, and they were on all kind of records, but you never knew it. And I'd just pick up a note here and there, but not from any particular person. And uh, not until uh, several years later did I start hearing, you know, got to meet some of these people. Back in my early days, from when I was at home, it was just pure hard-headedness. I was going to learn to play because I'd missed out all of whatever my dad and the three brothers had been doing. <laughs> and uh, when, when they were all at home before they uh, got married and left home, uh, they were all playing. They had all played around home, but uh, just nothing, not professionally, but uh, yeah, trying to find somewhere to play was the biggest problem. When I first uh, got back to Memphis, and there was first thing you have to do get your name out to different people, and uh, but there wasn't any bands. Uh, there was no set groups in any of the clubs or anything, and uh, that really disturbed me. I couldn't. It just it was. It was really rough, and. In meeting several people in the, around, that's how I had, had, had met Bill Black, uh, and 
I talked to him and then uh, the other guys that eventually was in the, it, we worked together. I found enough to work together that I said, now look, I'm gonna start a band, you guys wanna, uh, wanna be in it. And I said, if I get, uh, get work for us this coming weekend, fine, but if I don't have anything by like Wednesday, then you're free if you get a call between Wednesday and the weekend, you go ahead and do whatever. And this group was called the Starlight Wranglers. I had a uh, lead singer, which was Doug Poindexter, he also played guitar. Uh, Tommy Seeley played, uh, was a fiddle player. Clyde Rush was a, was a rhythm guitar player. And uh, who am I missing? Me, mm -hmm. I was in there too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and Miller Dial played steel guitar. It, you would say, well, it was country instruments, but you had to play playing these jobs you had to play for, for people to dance. It could be a pop song, it could be a country song, but it had to be where they could dance to it. People didn't care what it was. They, they didn't really care what, how I many was in the band or anything like that. It, it, it was just an added attraction, you know. I had formed this group of guys I was telling you about called Starlight Wranglers. And we, we got a radio show uh, Saturdays, 15 minutes, and we could uh, promote uh, wherever we were playing that night, which helped a little. Then I found out that uh, that there was a, a Memphis recording service uh, that the guy had a record label also. So I went, went down to see him, which was Sam Phillips. And uh, he agreed to let us come in. We went in and we just played our, our uh, played some of the tunes that we've been playing on stage, not not our own stuff. And he said, "I like the band and everything. So if you'll get some some of your own material to so come back, and I'd uh, like to listen to it again." Myself and uh, uh, and Doug Poindexter and uh, and my oldest brother uh, Carney, we wrote uh, uh, sat down and wrote two songs. And then we went back in to call Sam, and we went back in and, and played these two things for him, and he liked them and, and put those out. So I already had some connection with Sun on this, from this. And uh, I think maybe might have sold eight records, <laughs> or maybe ten, I don't know. I never did get a get a a strong count on it, but even anyway, from that uh, that experience, uh, I became good friends with Sam, and uh, uh, I'd go by drive by the studio a lot of times. If he wasn't busy, I'd drop in, and we'd go next door to Miss Taylor's restaurant and have coffee and just talk about the business in general. Uh, nothing, nothing playing with anybody, just to just chit chat. And uh, so one day, this was on a Saturday, I drove by there and uh, uh, he wasn't busy and, and we went next door and was having coffee and Marion, his secretary, came over and was having coffee with us. And uh, again, just chit-chatting about the, the business in general, nothing, did you hear so-and-so or something and the, that kind of thing. and. And uh, Marion spoke up and said, uh, said "Say, said, did you ever uh, think any more about that guy that was uh, was in here a few weeks back?" And he said, uh, he was, "No, didn't make any comment or anything." So a couple of weeks went by, and I was in there again. I asked him. I said, "By the way, I said, did you ever?" Because it just stuck in my mind. And uh, I said, "Did you ever?" Uh, Contact that guy that you said was in here uh, that you liked or had listened to or something. I don't remember exactly what I said. And he said, no, I didn't. He turned to Marion again said, uh, said, Marion, said, go said go over and get that boy's uh, 
uh, telephone number and give it to Scotty and said, uh, and he turned to me and said, uh, he still hadn't called his name now through all of this. And, and he turned to me and said, uh, said, when you get this number, said, you call him and uh, see what, get him to come in and see what you think, or get him to see what you think. And uh, she came back, brought, handed me the slip of paper, and I looked at it, and I said, that was Presley. What kind of damn name is that? Just, there again, we're sitting at a coffee table just chit-chatting, you know. And uh, so we left, and when I got home, I called, and uh, his mother answered the phone, and I told her, I said, I'm working in conjunction with, with uh, uh, Sam Phillips down at Sun Records, and uh, I'd like to talk to, to, to Elvis. She said, well, he's at, uh, at the Suzor's, I believe it was a movie house. I said, I'll have him call you. As soon as he gets in, he should be in pretty soon. And so I guess about an hour later, <clears throat> about an hour later, he called and uh, I told him who I was and asked him to go over to my house the next day, and uh, which he did. And Bill Black lived just a few doors down the, on the same street from me. And uh, he came down also that same day and I listened to him. And, and what we know from that on, well, old hell broke loose, didn't it? <laughs> okay, so that was on Monday night, and uh, Sam came out. We listened to the thing we'd just cut, you know, it just cut. And, uh, I'm trying to remember what Sam had said. said that uh, he made some comment. I don't remember exactly what he said, but something. And uh, he didn't say like this was a record or anything. Uh, but after the ne I think it was the next night that he had had made an acetate and took it down to Dewey Phillips at WHBQ and to get Dewey's opinion on what he thought about it. And I'm sure you've read the stories where that. Uh, do it and called Elvis and uh, asked him to come down to interview him. And he had do it, sit there and talk to him with the mic open the whole time. <laughs> and, he, and he didn't know it, any of that at all. So, uh, anyway, he played the record and he got all the, the radio, got so many calls for it. And then Sam, uh, it called me, this was on Monday, Tuesday, so he called me, actually on Wednesday, because he had been down to do his on Tuesday night, had been down to his on Tuesday night. He called me on Wednesday, uh, and Bill also, and I said, he said, y'all got to come back in, we've got to do a B-side B for a record for this. And that was, so we went in and went through this whole process again, played everything we'd played before and, and uh, sitting there, and Bill was sitting. A, you ever seen somebody sit on a bass fiddle? He, Bill was sitting straddle of his bass fiddle, and he started beating it and started singing in a high pro, falsetto voice, uh, "Blue Moon of Kentucky." And Elvis knew the records. He knew the lyrics. He started singing with him, and that was the B side. So we didn't, and we hadn't gone in to to do a, a a legitimate record or anything in the first place. We just went in because all thing else, all thing Sam wanted was a little music behind uh, behind Elvis because if you remember the old uh, things that you used to have in fairs and whatever that you could go in a booth and and record your voice on it, this little funky. Uh, recorders and I'm just real tinny and everything. Well that's basically what, what else I mean what Sam was was uh him and his secretary was doing the daytime people go in and he wasn't doing this stuff. Tape was very new. And uh, a lot of the things that we had put on tape the first night we were in there, he never kept. He he, he erased them. He did keep two or three things. 
that were later released. Never could figure that out either. Because we did do uh, a few things I thought was pretty good that he had raised. Sam had asked, asked me and uh, Bill come in. Uh, he, he didn't want the whole band, uh, but he wanted to hear what else would sound like just on tape. So that's the reason it was just the two of us. Every time, every time we went in after the first record, uh, we'd go through the same process. Because there, was there wasn't anybody pitching songs or beating the door down to record this or anything. And so between, between the four of us, uh, well actually Mary and five, and whatever song anybody could think of, we'd try to play it or see if we could make something out of it in uh, kind of in that same direction, you know, same, same way. And uh, we'd finally hit on something. And that's one reason that uh, uh, I think that he uh, always ended up doing some of Sam's songs that he'd recorded on artists before because he, he liked the, that kind of music. But that wasn't what he was trying to do him personally. It's stuff that he would do, I don't think even with his folks at home, you know, but it was stuff that he liked. Sam was getting orders in locally, uh, record stores and everybody was hollering and screaming they wanted the songs, and of course he didn't have them, and he was trying to get them pressed, and uh, it was probably a good, uh, probably a week, maybe two weeks before he actually had, had any records, uh, and uh, I don't remember the exact count, but he had several a few thousand orders already just there in, in Memphis and uh, of course then we, we played a a, a uh, concert there at the Overton Park Shell Slim Whitman I think was a headliner uh I don't remember who all else was on that show. Bob Neal, who was this jockey, uh, had gotten us on that show. Because he, well, of course, we had the radio stations between him and Sleepy Eyed John, uh, opposing stations, they already had it, had the records going. One was playing one song and the other one was playing the backside. So it was that kind of thing going. And the interesting part about that is that when we did that show, the shell is still there, by the way. They they repainted it and Gordon kind of spruced it up a little bit. But uh, uh, we'd only recorded that one song. So we went out there and did that, of course. And now your guitar player, all right, if you keep this in mind, and all the people out there that's watching, if you keep this in mind, if you play, especially if you play guitar, stand up, take the guitar, and play a rhythm. Now, but you got to raise up on the balls of your feet, both feet at the same time while you're playing. Now, in 1954, the pants, the legs were pretty big. Now, you're going to do a bunch of shaking and stuff, right? Or at least your clothes are. Now, that's where it started. That is where it started. When we came off, we did two shows. We did an afternoon show and did a night show. But when we came off the first afternoon, uh, the afternoon show, and I was coming in and he said, uh, talking to Bob Neal and, and Sam said, said what did I do? So those girls in the front row said they was, was laughing and carrying on. What did I do? What did I do wrong? He said nothing. You didn't do anything wrong. He said you was just you was shaking. And Elvis was a very fast learner and a very uh, he, anything he'd do. Uh, if he, he could tell that the crowd liked it, then he'd, he'd do it again. I mean, he was. I give him credit. He could. He could spot stuff. I was busy. 
trying to find what key it was in, you know. <laughs> you, you remember the old Wiggle little finger? That's part of his stuff. People think that it was natural. It was natural. It was natural because he could do it naturally. It made it look natural. But it, it was it was part of the show. Well, uh, Bob, uh, uh, of course, I had signed a contract uh, for a year as manager. This was, uh, we were all down at, at Sun one day, and uh, it was, asked, was talking to Sam. He said, he said, I don't know what to do. I know these people call me, want to do this, want to do that. And and he said, I'll tell you what to do. He said, why don't you sign a contract with Scotty? For a year, give us the time to find somebody that we 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 trust and like, and that's how that that part came about. And I found out real quick that being a manager wasn't wasn't all it was cut out to be. Tell you the truth, and so then we hooked up with Bob because Bob Neal had been booking us in a, on a lot of gigs, uh, in especially in Mississippi, because he was on the radio. Early morning started uh, I don't know five or six o'clock in the morning till but he had that early morning drive thing and we, and we station WMPS WMPS I believe I'm not sure on that call letters but uh, boom down in Mississippi and so he had all the all the cotton pickers and and concert uh, concert stuff going on down there. And it kept us going, uh, especially on weekends, because Bill and I were still at day jobs. And we went on with that for uh, a couple of months, I guess. And uh, then it started getting, as it gave time, the records started getting out into other stations and such. And then we started uh, uh, going further out father out in Mississippi, father out in Arkansas, and he finally got to the point where we couldn't we, we couldn't do them in, on, a, on a weekend. And that's when uh, Bill and I both had to quit, quit our day jobs and uh, go in full time. So every time we recorded, we did the same same thing. With, uh, and half the time we'd end up doing one of, one of Sam's songs because he had a stuff he'd been doing with all of his black artists, you know, that, uh, and that's where, that's our writing come from, and, uh, gosh, I, we tried everything in the world, uh, but it wasn't, he wasn't pushing his songs, it was just finding something that, would, that felt good for us, to, for us to sing, and for us to do. Well, during that period, just, like I was saying, we, uh, Bill and I had quit our day jobs, and we had signed. Uh, we actually signed Bob Neal for a manager uh, before that year was up. It was, I guess, I don't, I don't remember exact dates, but uh, and then when we had quit our day jobs, then he was started booking us out further away and in the meantime we'd gone to the opera and got uh, didn't get do any good up there I'm sure everybody's seen that little episode in the uh, following uh, week or two weeks later I think went to uh, Shreveport uh, to the Louisiana Hayride and uh, and that's where we met uh, we met DJ at that point and he, he played with us behind the curtain. That's when we, uh, he, that's one thing he'd tell, we got him out behind the curtain. <laughs> His claim to fame. <laughs> uh, and during that process is when uh, Tom Parker had been snooping around and had spotted him and people were telling him about him and he was, uh, was actually going in to see shows, but nobody knew he was there or anything. And he actually 
worked worked his way in to take over finally over. You know, I've got a letter somewhere here that uh, while he was uh, while Parker was uh, promoting uh, Eddie Arnold and uh, he had Tom Diskin, his right hand man, had an office in Chicago, and I found that I didn't know anything about any any anybody in that, but uh, it was called Jamboree Attractions. And his office was in Chicago, and I'd sent a letter up there and got turned down. So, I'll give you a little insight of <laughs> all that part of it. <laughs> and uh, so, uh, then of course he signed with RCA at that point. Uh, and we then cut, uh, went to Nashville. And uh, made the first session for RCA, which was uh, Heartbreak Hotel. Like I said, we had met DJ uh, at Shreveport, and he played with us on the Hayride the first time. But uh, we didn't know if had any money to begin with in that, that period of time. But Every time we would go out on past out of Memphis, uh, in anywhere in that general direction towards Shreveport, we'd call DJ and and if it was feasible for us to go through and pick him up, or if it was where he could drive and meet us at some of those places in in uh, East Texas or or somewhere like that, uh, well, he played with us. But the first time he, that he actually played with it, uh, that actually recorded with us, was Heartbreak Hotel in uh, in Nashville. Fortunately, other than a few of the movie things that we worked on later on, uh, that's where we always worked. We'd go in, even after Elvis uh, had it, the publishing companies and all this, well, they'd bring in loads of big stack of demos and things for him to listen to. and. Uh, We never would listen to him. We'd drink coffee or do whatever till they always picked a song out of the stack. And then once he picked a song out, uh, then we'd listen to it and then we'd learn it and then try it and see if we could do it. But he never he never told anybody what to play. We Everything that you heard uh, in all those early days was just our own invention. Good, bad, or indifferent. I mean, that was it. <laughs> yeah, like I said, what? Of course, when we got into movies, there was a lot of things that they would. Uh, I hate to admit that we actually played on some of them. To tell you the truth, things happened too fast back then. That was one problem. Uh, like when I came out of the navy, and uh, actually, actually, when I had gone to. To to uh, to see Sam to uh, in the very early days, I had a day job already. I went to work for my oldest brother at his cleaning plant, the University Park Cleaners, and learned to be a hatter. And hats was really a good business at that time. And. I was very happy with what I was doing. If I could play, play a little bit on the weekend at a uh, club, and uh, till I had the day job, I'd be through by two thirty in the afternoon, and I had a lot of free time that way. And uh, just that, that I didn't see any need to do it. There wasn't any, wasn't wasn't high on my on my list. But after I got it, got tied in with the everything else, I could see. Then I was going, we were going, always going so much I didn't have time. <laughs> when we started doing movies, and when we were, he had us in the first two, three movies, like background or something. Uh, well, you know, sometimes it'd take them an hour to reset and do all that, and we were sitting around where you. 
doing nothing, you know. So Elvis got me and said, well, well, I'd take my amplifier because they ain't furnished nothing. I'd have my amplifier sitting on stage so he'd get the electricians to, to run a line over and plug it in and we just start jamming out there on the session. And pretty soon all, all the guys on the set would, were they supposed to be resetting and doing everything else? They, all of them would gather around and we just they were doing a show for them. <laughs> Well, we got we got tight for stuff we was doing on that we were doing on stage. Uh, I used to fuss at DJ and Bill all the time. We was on the road. I said, "Let's we be together and work up some stuff." I don't know, no, no, no. you be sure to lay a DJ when you can see him today. Tell him, hey, yeah. no, 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 hell no. The B side. Let's go to bar. Let's get a drink. <laughs> I'd have to bring all my drums up here to the room. I said, you play on a snag. No, no. Don't do that. Hound Dog was a B-side of Don't Be Cruel. Those two were cut in New York. And I knew there was, t I knew there was two that was cut, uh, was released together and were both two-sided hits. Don't be cruel to who hard is true. First thing was just uh, uh, just uh, that's all it was to it. <laughs> wow. It could be any more simpler, I don't think. There's nothing that I do. Any different? I never liked a bunch of highs is the whole thing, but also uh, it's got to have a guitar cut. If it's recording, it's got to have enough that it'll cut through. It's just like a regular amplifier. The only thing is, it's uh, Ray Butts built this amp for me after the first record we did, uh, well, Blue Moon, uh, Blue Moon, Kentucky, because it had slapback on it. Sam had. Uh, he says that he discovered it by mistake. Now, I don't know if that's true or not, but uh, you take the output of a tape machine and then run it back into another machine and you get that, this, this, that slight delay from the two playback heads. And it gives it that slapback effect. And he was using that on, on early the early r records. Well, so we would go out and play... Uh, it's little schoolhouses or whatever. Well, it's always sounded empty because it's it had a better with the slapback. It had fuller sound, and not then I heard this amp. Uh, Ray Butts up in Cairo, Illinois built it. And it actually has a tape in the in the bottom of it. It goes round and round, and you could adjust it, and I could get the same effect with, uh, with that way. But that wasn't really, I kept my tone was about the same like it was just playing straight. It wasn't any different. Very first record, that, yeah, first record I used it on was Mr. Train. Now some, so some records I didn't use it, I wasn't using the effect on. Uh, I don't, don't remember right offhand which ones, but uh, some of them it just played just like it was a plain amplifier. That's All Right, as recorded by Elvis Presley in the 1950s. And for the acoustic guitar, you're just playing rhythm. And in one sense, it's simple, just three basic chords, really, an A major chord in open position, a D7 chord, which is my first finger on the first fret of the second string, second finger on the second fret of the third string, and the third finger on the second fret of the first string, to an E chord or an E7 chord. So E7, I'm just adding the uh, fourth finger on the third fret of the second string to a basic open E chord. And I want to mention that when you watch Elvis play these uh, rhythm parts on the acoustic, he had a tendency to just play basic major chords on the acoustic. And combining that with Scotty's dominant uh, chords, 
created the overall the overall sound, the dominant sound. But certainly if you were playing this on an acoustic guitar by itself without the electric, you'd really want to play those dominant chords for D7 and E7. So that's what I'm going to demonstrate. Um, and so the strumming pattern on the A chord as it comes in is going to sound something like this. Kind of a very uh, quintessential country kind of strum. And what I'm doing there is alternating the bass notes. So I'm picking the open fifth string and then strumming down up and then picking the open sixth string to alternate the bass and down up again. So again, it's just a basic uh, alternating bass note pattern. And if you counted out the intro, it would actually be two and a half measures, so or 10 beats. So it'd sound like you started on beat three. Three, four, one, two. Three, four, one, two, three, four, like that. Uh, when the band kicks in, the form itself is going to be unusual. You're going to start with four measures of A. So on the first verse here, you start with four measures of A, two measures of D7, and then two measures of E7, and then to one measure of A. So that really accounts for nine measures in total, which is unusual. So that's a nine measure form to begin with. And you're going to do the same thing. Uh, a second time, so another nine measures. The whole nine measure pattern is like this. And uh, so that's the first time through the form and the second time through the form, nine measures. When you get to the guitar solo, it's simply uh, 10 measures by adding one extra measure of A. So you're simply adding one extra measure of A at the very end for the guitar solo. The fourth time through the form, you're going to play the same nine measure pattern that we had earlier. And then the uh, fifth time through the form, this is where it gets really weird, you're going to actually just skip a measure of A. So you're going to play three measures of A to two measures of D to two measures of E and then back to the A chord. And really, it just stays on that A chord for another three measures and ends on the A. And so that's the acoustic rhythm guitar for That's All Right. This is the acoustic performance of That's All Right. Well, that's all right, mama. That's all right for you. That's all right, mama. Just any way you do. That's all right. That's all right. That's all right now, mama. Any way you do. Well, mama, she done told me. Papa done told me too. Son, that gal you're fooling with, she ain't no good for you. That's all right. That's all right. Scotty Moore's guitar tone is the quintessential rockabilly guitar sound, and that's based on a few important elements. The first being an arch top hollow body electric guitar, 
uh, like his ES-295 that he played for most of those early recordings. And it seems to me that he tended to use the middle position uh, for the pickup selector switch. Uh, in other words, combining the bridge and the neck pickup together for most of the, the sound. Maybe in some recordings he'd use the bridge uh, as well. Um, as far as the EQ on the amp goes, it's pretty even. One of the things he did mention in the interviews is that he didn't really like guitar tones that had too much treble in them. So you notice on the uh, amp EQ here, I have them set in the middle. Although, of course, each amp is really different as far as the EQ. You just want to find a good balance uh, and not get too piercing a treble uh, sound. And um, one important thing is with the bass on a, on a hollow electric guitar, it's very important to not get too much bass because the guitar itself has, has a good amount of bass to begin with, but if you add too much bass, it's really going to feed back a lot, especially at higher volumes. So you have to be careful about that. Um, and of course, the critical element behind the rockabilly sound is the slapback echo. Scotty's Echosonic amp that was designed by and built by Ray Butts uh, actually had a tape delay in the bottom of it, uh, a tape head that actually would play back what he played about 100 milliseconds or uh, about 100 milliseconds behind what he actually played, so it would actually echo it with a tape echo. And uh, before he got that amp, he was playing, I think, through a Fender Deluxe uh, amp in the in the early Sun Records, things like that. All right, Mom, on those first sessions, um, he was playing just a, a straight tube amp, like a Fender Deluxe. But Sam Phillips was actually, uh, who was the engineer on those sessions, was actually uh, using tape delay in the, in the recording booth, so he would actually play what he had recorded through another tape deck and run it back in and that uh, slapback echo was around that 100 millisecond, 100, 115, 120 millisecond kind of uh, area. And you can emulate that with a digital delay pedal uh, or you know analog delay pedal. Uh, it's really not rocket science, you just set it so you get that that quick repeat. and. Uh, for those kind of sounds, it just kind of fills up the sound a little more. Um, it's important that the echo is almost as loud as the actual note you're playing, if not as loud, and that it doesn't repeat too much. So that's just one or two quick repeats on things like Heartbreak Hotel. You almost don't perceive uh, an echo after the sound so much as you just hear it fatten up the tone. And um, one last thing you can do to really get that vintage kind of sound is maybe use some spring reverb. This amp has some spring reverb built into it in the back. And uh, it just kind of helps the 50s and 60s vibe if you have a good tube amp with a spring reverb. Although I don't really hear, to be honest, that much spring reverb in Scotty's actual tone. It definitely is part of the rockabilly sound. And if you do use the spring reverb, you just want to be uh, sparing with it because you don't want to combine too much echo with too much spring reverb, that can really muddy up the tone. So that's the Scotty Moore guitar tone. That's all right, mama. That's all right for you. That's all right, mama. Just any way you do, that's all right. That's I'm going to play the electric rhythm part and then explain it slowly. So that starts with an A major chord uh, for the first, actually the first four bars are really A. And an A major chord in the fifth position, my first finger's barred across the top two strings at the fifth fret. My second finger's on the sixth fret of the third string. My third finger's on the seventh fret of the fourth string. So just strumming the A chord and adding a sixth uh, scale degree, so an F sharp here on the seventh fret of the second string with the fourth finger. So it's on an upstroke like that. And then sliding up to an A chord inversion, up here at the ninth position. So my first finger is barring across the ninth fret, strings one, two, and three. My second finger is on the tenth fret of the second string. My third finger is on the eleventh fret of the fourth string. And I'm going to add the uh, fourth finger on the high E here on the twelfth fret of the first string. Just like that. So it's. You play it three times. And in the fourth measure, you go to A7. So for this A7, I'm in the 
seventh position, my first finger is on the seventh fret of the fourth string, my second finger is on the eighth fret of the second string, my third finger is on the ninth fret of the third string, and the fourth finger is on the ninth fret of the first string. So that's A7. You just strum it in sixteenth notes. Which is just down up um, through the whole bar. Then it goes to a D9 chord or a D7 chord with a, um, the chord that he actually frets as a D9 over A. So he's got the first finger on the uh, fourth fret of the fourth string. And then the third finger is going to be on the fifth fret of the third string. The fourth finger will be on the fifth fret of strings one and two. And the second finger is going to cover both the fifth and sixth string at the fifth fret. So that's a D9 over A, or just, you can think of it really as D7 in the context. Um, and so there's a bunch of different hybrid picking patterns that you could use on this. There's one in particular that works well. Like this. So if I go um, with, the, with the palm of my hand, just muting the bass notes, and I'm going to pick with the third finger in this case. Um, some guys like to use thumb picks. I just happen to use a pick and, a, and you know, standard pick and, and uh, add my second and third fingers to pick the higher notes. But thumb picks work just as well. So the idea really is to get the bass notes with a palm muting sound uh, on the downbeats more or less and to get the, the higher notes on the offbeats. So, so that pattern right there, um, does this, it keeps the bass notes moving in quarter notes. So you get one, two, three, four. Like that. So I'll show you that slowly. If I play the sixth string, and then the first string, and then the fifth to the second string, you kind of skip up to that second string early. So it's like that. The sixteenth note early. And then picking both the third and the sixth string together, so you get and then the fourth string, second string, fifth string, first string. So we get. So that's a good hybrid picking pattern for these chords. Uh, you could do something else like, which kind of changes the bass uh, rhythm into a different, more syncopated. And all I'm doing there is going six one five two four three. Five, two, six, one. In terms of the the picking uh, of the strings. So you're going to do two, two measures of uh, D7, and then down to E7. So this is a standard E7 chord, just like we had in the acoustic part. And of course, you could do the same hybrid picking parts here. In terms of the picking directions, or. Either one of those. And of course, when Scotty does it, it's so effortless and he just plays it um, off the cuff. Uh, it sort of seems like he never does it the same way twice. So part of the, the fun of that is experimenting with it. And really, the, the essence is really to get the bass notes palm muted on the downbeats, more or less, and the upper notes on the offbeats. And after that, it just goes back to a measure of the A. And there's a few different places where the whole form is nine measures long, and then during the uh, solo it's ten measures, and the, the last time through it's actually abbreviated. So uh, in order to really understand the form, I would, I would um, refer you to the acoustic form video that explains that in more detail. But those are the electric guitar parts over the progression. So that's the electric guitar for That's All Right Mama. I'm going to play this solo in time and then explain it slowly. So that starts with a walk up, uh, just starting up the sixth string, up the scale. Uh, the open sixth string to the second fret, to the fourth fret, and then uh, to the fifth fret, 
on the, all on the sixth string palm muted. Starting on the and of three, and four, and one. And then he goes into a little riff here in thirds on the second and third string. Actually, it'd be best to play that with the second and third finger. So that's the second finger on the fifth fret of the second string, and the third finger on the sixth fret of the third string. Just pick those together, bring them down to the third and fourth fret, down to the second fret, and then slide back from the third and fourth to the fifth and sixth. We get. You're just going to play that three times in a row. And then in the fourth measure, there's a little blues lick into the four chord. So you're going to start with the seventh fret to the fifth fret on the second string, and then a half step bend from the seventh fret on the second string, brought down to the seventh fret again, fifth fret on the second string, and then seven, six, four on the third string. So good. And then the chromatic. Uh, line down the fourth string here, seven, six, five. So again, that's going to be. And that would set you into the D9 chord. At this time uh, point, he's hybrid picking, and the exact pattern that he plays will sound like this. It's going to start with the, this is the same D9 chord, of course, that we had in the form. Sixth string to the first string, and then six, three, five. So the first half of that. First string, fifth, fourth, sixth string, first, fifth. So that's. I'm just going to play that twice in a row. And then down to the E7 chord. A similar pattern. The open sixth string, the first string, six, three, five. So you get. At this point, he adds the uh, sharp nine in the chord. So this is the third fret of the first string the G up here with the uh, fourth finger on the third fret of the first string. Picking the fourth and third string to get, and uh, first string rather together. And you're going to pick the fourth, first, sixth, first, and second. So that's like that. And then the same thing again. You just kind of end on that fifth uh, string at the very end of that. that. And then it moves up to that same A6 chord riff, and you can play that with a, a full bar chord, or you can play it like we did in the, in the verse, or the form. We had the A major to the A6 for a measure. Um, actually, at the end of the solo, it's going to be two measures of A. Or you could play the full bar chord. So for the bar chord, my first finger is across the fifth fret, strings one through uh, six, and then I've got the second finger, of course, on the sixth fret of the third string. The um, third finger is actually going to bar across strings four and five here at the seventh fret. So that's A major, and then you've got the fourth finger there to put the sixth on it. On the uh, F sharp there on the seventh fret of the second string. So you get. And that's the guitar solo for That's All Right. This is the electric performance of That's All Right. Well, that's all right, mama. That's all right for you. That's all right, mama. Just any way you do. That's all right. That's all right. That's all right. 
that's all right, that's all right now, mama. Any way you do, I da da dee 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 dee. I need your loving. That's all right. That's all right.